got 16 hours, so good luck. Okay, we're we'll, good. We'll yeah. we'll bang it out, Logue. All right. I'll stay close by just in case. That's a lie. You're going to be playing games downstairs yeah. with Mac. <laughs> mm-hmm. We, uh, we're, we're sitting in an unusual place. We are quite a bit further north than we typically are in the month of middle August, yeah. right, Case? I would say so. We're overlooking a beautiful river. Oh, and we are joined by a couple guests. What's that river? I don't know the name. What is it? This is a Chino. Chino River. Yeah. And in Fairbanks, Alaska. Fairbanks. So we're in Fairbanks, Alaska. If if you guys have been following along with some of our adventures over the past 12 months, you would know that Logie Bear and I went to Kodiak. That was Alaska numero uno. That and was, we, uh, yeah. It was a big deal. Experience number one. It was pretty. It was it was amazing. We had a great time chasing Sitka blacktail deer, predominantly some waterfowl, and kind of really opened up our eyes to all things that Alaska could offer. Now, I think, as most of us that live in the lower forty eight would suggest, Alaska is a place you always want to go, but you're not necessarily sure how to get there. And I think the first step, as in so many parts of life, is just taking it got to just go do it. So we did Kodiak, and then more recently, Case, you and Logie Bear did a little fishing adventure. Yeah, we did. We went to uh, Alaska this summer and yep. did some fishing. Which is also on the YouTubes, so you can check that video out. And now we are here. We're just wrapping up quite an adventure. Yeah. And we are joined by our good friend Luke from Weatherby. And if, if you guys recall, like we've worked with Weatherby for a l- quite a few years. We were, ironically enough, introduced to the Weatherby crew by Chad Mendez, UFC, yep. former UFC fighter. Yep. Good friend of ours at SHOT Show, uh, I believe maybe 2015 or 16. You're time, so right? good with the numbers. I'm a numbers guy, Case. <laughs> <laughs> so Chad I don't inter- know what day it is. Yeah, right Chad now. introduced us to the Weatherby crew. And... Uh, we've said this a lot, but the people we tend to lean towards working with are those where we trust in the product and we trust in the people. And when we met Adam and the entire crew at Weatherby, uh, and then they made their transition from California to the great state of Wyoming, Mm -hmm. it's just been a good, it's been a great fit. And, uh, some of you may be aware, we launched the Weatherby Vanguard Hush Edition Rifle where we had a chance to kind of collaborate with the guys at Weatherby, come up with a rifle that had like a color colorway and some different accents that were stuff that we helped design. And then we picked a selection of options um, from a cartridge standpoint that were going to be available. And it's been super cool to work with these guys. So one of the greatest things I think about the Weatherby brand is that it's continually, to this day, owned by Weatherby. Mm-hmm. Pretty hard to say. Like, I don't think there's many firearm companies. Luke, you can correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> no, there's there's only a handful of companies in this space that are still family-owned. There's not many at all. So we did the Hush Life movie back in 2017, and we went on a great elk hunt with Adam Weatherby, who is the current president, CEO, and the grandson of Roy Weatherby. Yeah. The original founder. Which, if you guys are into firearms, Weatherby has a pretty pretty incredible history. Like, when I was a kid growing up, my dad was way into Weatherby. He has a couple shotguns, a rifle, and it was just had this, like, level of significance that seemed different than other firearm companies. Mm-hmm. And Roy was a real... I mean, is genius too strong of a word? I'd no. say pioneer. <clears throat> yeah, he was a pioneer. Pioneer I mean, he, of, of super fast cartridges. He was a really, really strong marketer yeah. um, and, and well ahead of his time. I mean, so many of the cartridges that he made in the first 10 years of our of our company's history are still like some, some of our top cartridges. Like name, name a couple. 257, 300 Weatherby. Yep. I the like 257 is still the fastest 25, the 240, like it's fastest 243, like 76 years later, still crushing it. Still you know? crushing. I'll never forget right. on the hunt we went on with Adam, he he was able to take an elk, nice six point, after 
we hunted super hard. And this was, again, Hush Life the movie, if you guys have ever watched it or you care to watch it. And he just, he's like, thanks, thanks Grandpa, because he was shooting yeah. 300 Weatherby yeah. for so many years ago um, that he actually came up with that. Yeah. And to your point, Luke, it still resonates today as one of the faster, flatter shooting ones you're going to find. Yeah, we, we beat ourselves basically with a 3378 Weatherby. Um, that was in the – oh, man, I'm going to get my dates wrong on that one. That one always throws me for a yeah. curveball because it was quite a bit later in our company's history. But 3378 is the fastest production, 30 cal. But the 300 Weatherby is probably the most versatile – cartridge in our lineup it's one of those ones where you can kind of like we get a lot of questions on hey what would you recommend Mm -hmm. so yeah just like dating back like we offer the hush weatherby rifle in five cartridges which is the 300 weatherby yep 7mm 257 six and a half 300 and six five creed yep six and a half creed which i think the six and a half creed is the most popular if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I believe it is, and I think 6.5300 is right after that. Yep. Um, all great options. But we, uh, we, we were invited, this actually was last year, to come to Alaska and do a caribou hunt. And there was a lot of things going on in the world. COVID was kind of uh, up and coming at the moment. Mm-hmm. And so for a lot of reasons, amongst other schedule conflicts, we opted to pass... Which, in hindsight, it wasn't we, the greatest option. Yeah, we uh, particularly after they got back into service, we saw pictures. Immediately started and sending photos of all the successes, <laughs> all the great of the things hunt. of what Alaska could provide. Well, there was a lot of things that went sideways with the trip last year. Originally, it was going to be a fly-in, yep. and I think the air service that you guys were going to use or we were going to use shut down. Just completely. was like, hey, because of COVID, yep. uh, I don't have enough clients to cover my insurance, so I'm just not going to do that. The dude was, <laughs> he was a pilot for Raven Air, which was a big Alaska mm. charter transporter service that went belly up with COVID. And then yeah. to your point, Luke, he didn't have the insurance to cover Transpo- transporting. Yeah. So he just like totally shifted life gears and said, I'm not transporting anymore. I'm going to go do something else to just provide for my family. So we looked at, Kevin and I looked at a bunch of different options to fly in. Didn't make sense. And eventually you guys kind of landed on this DIY yeah. option and you crushed it. Well, yeah, we landed on this DIY option. We've got a podcast on the trip that we did last year on, on our Mark the Weatherby podcast. Um, we got some tips from some industry friends. Basically our plan was to raft, down a little ways, a big river, up a small river, hike to the five mile mark and hopefully shoot some caribou. And uh, long story short, back our camera guy, uh, one of his bags didn't make it to Fairbanks. So we had a bunch of time to kill. We we're at Sportsman's Warehouse. We were talking to the counter guys at the gun counter and uh, they're like, oh man, you guys are from Weatherby. What are you doing here? Blah, blah, blah. We're like, hey, we're, we're going to do this DIY caribou hunt. It's going to be awesome. He's like, yeah, uh, my buddy Hook, he runs an airboat up there. He'll take you up the river. We're like, what are you talking about, airboats? I didn't even think airboats were a thing here. Like, I'm from Texas. You know, they run them in the swamps and Louisiana and all that. So uh, we we change our plan based off a five-minute conversation. We get airboated in. We shoot three caribou. We raft out. And then we start sending you guys the pictures, and you're like, no. Yeah, so this is 2020. I blame we're Casey talking about. for the record. 100% it was Casey's fault. He he canceled on this trip. I did. I, I 100% canceled. I was nervous when uh, this COVID thing took off. And I was thinking about flying to, not a different country, obviously, but flying you had to, to Alaska. You had to do, you had you had to do, do pre-travel COVID. testing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was kind of new at the time. Yeah. I was like, well, I want to go somewhere that I can't get back to my family. Yeah. And uh, you guys went and did it. Yeah. You're, you're just trying to say you're like a better husband than, than us or what? <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm saying <laughs> I wussed out. <laughs> and it looked amazing. But I have to tell you, like Luke just said, if you guys have not listened to On Your Mark podcast by the web, weather crew go listen to it what's that what's that episode called uh i think it's just called the caribou 
edition or something. I, I can't remember the actual name of it, honestly. Um, so here's my thoughts yeah. on that. Like, I had talked to you about it. I talked to Kevin about it. Like, I like told you guys, I want to go do a caribou hunt in Alaska. Mm-hmm. I want to go experience it. Like, I'm terrified of bears. I'm terrified of floating. I'm terrified of, like, little planes. Case, Casey's ter- scared of a lot of things. He's scared of uh, snakes, snakes and mice, too. Does like I, I mice. feel you on snakes. Yeah. I don't know. Man, If he, he, he hides the terrified of rafting pretty well. I mean, he looked like a full-on river guy. Going quiet. back to last he gets year. He going turned, back to last year, I was like, <laughs> I need to get over this fear of all these things. I, I like that you I, just... I have you, reasonings... I have reasons to be terrified of these things. There, that there is a backstory on the water thing, right? The water thing, there is a backstory. We let's uh, hear it real quick. So when I was a younger child, like when I was twelve, um, the church I grew up in did these father and son outings, and we would take a bunch of mm-hmm. dads and their kids, and we would go do something. If it was backpacking, rafting, whatever it might be, this specific year we were going to go rafting down you might know it's the snake river but yeah. it goes in from uh jackson hole to palisades reservoir oh yeah that's super a pretty, popular yeah that's a good run place. good run so one of the guys in our church had been a guide when he was a younger lad he was like 65 when he took us but he was probably 18 19 when he was a, a river guide so just two lifetimes yeah, between. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no no time apart. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm sure he had done it a few times since then. But it was, I would say it was, I was telling you this the other day when we were floating down. I think it was the summer of 94, 95. And it was like one of the biggest uh, runoffs Idaho, Wyoming has ever yeah. had. And so we went to start floating down to this father and son outing. Like, enjoy time with your dad. Enjoy time with your son. And we rolled the boat, and it was terrifying. And ever since then, since I yeah. was 12, I've been terrified of water. But I love fishing. I love rafting. I love rowing a boat. But I've just never got myself to a point where I want to go do that. Yeah. And I have a 13-year-old son that wants to raft. I have a, a 7-year-old son that wants to go fish. So finally, I was just like, I have to figure out my like way to get over this fear. Yeah. Hold on. So <laughs> I should be more specific about our, our hunt too. Is so we airboated in and then we used pack alpaca pack rafts and packed packed out. Um, and that, that episode's called um, caribou hunting the Dalton highway. So if you want to find that, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it's not a, not there's not really white water like the rivers are so big yeah. in alaska they're just wide and grand they're i don't know but going back to the point yeah. like um we were supposed to do it last year which you guys went and did and uh and it was none of that that like wanted me like not go it was the fact of like not being able to know exactly like what the covid thing was going to do sure if I could get back to my there family. There was a chance that we whatever. got stuck here. Yeah, I had to for like sure. quarantine for 12 days, whatever it was. But as soon as you guys started sending pictures, <laughs> fear, <laughs> me and fear Brian were like. Fear of missing out yeah. kicked in yeah. pretty substantially. That sucks. Yeah. And then even more so, I think I called you, like when you guys released your podcast, and you showed this one picture of you guys rafting down the river after your hunt with caribou on the boats. Mm-hmm. And there was muskox in the background. Yeah, and I said, I want to do that. That was a pretty cool. Like, pinch yourself. Is this real life kind yeah. of moment? Like, I mean, I, is, is, this can't be happening right now. I would argue there's not a ton of people in the world that have seen muskox in particular, particularly when you have a alpaca raft full of <laughs> caribou <laughs> in front of you. And I mean, you know, like. Getting into Alaska, we've always wanted to be able to document and show stuff that other people could do. Mm-hmm. Right? They're not these like ridiculously expensive type hunts that are going to take somebody a ton of time and maybe a ton of money to do. So, like realistic opportunities to come to Alaska. So, the Kodiak series was great. It's certainly one that's affordable, it's doable, it's a DIY transporter situation with a boat. The reality with Alaska. 
whether you're a non-resident or a resident, like boats or planes are the two ways you predominantly hunt. There's just not a lot of roads in Alaska to access from. No, and walking on the tundra is not awesome. We have always put that in the front of our mind of getting into Alaska. We want to do some stuff that other folks could experience. Mm -hmm. So Kodiak, check that box. Super great. This caribou hunt is another one that very doable. There's different ways to do it. You can do the fly-in stuff, right? So you, you drive up north and you have an opportunity to get dropped off by a float plane. You also can utilize a boat, and then you can drive. You can just drive the road and hunt off yeah, the road. You can you can hunt off the road archery, off the road archery within a five miles span of either side of the road. Mm-hmm. There's other ways you you can do it. Obviously, by just going down the road with archery tackle and hunting directly off the road, mm-hmm. or you can make it five miles to the barrier, and then you can utilize a rifle so some guys will pack both equipment yeah make the long hike but the tundra is not what i would consider easy hiking and so five miles for some folks is just a little bit too much before you could pick up a rifle it might be easier to swim five miles i would i would agree (laughs) or float or float man so what we're talking about what brian's talking about is if you go up the hall road there is a barrier that you have to be five miles from the road that you can actually use a rifle on to hunt because the Alaska pipeline runs down that road. Mm-hmm. So you can either go up that road and archery hunt it, or you have to hike five miles or get rafted up or flown in to rifle hunt. Yep. Right? So fast, fast forward to nine, nine days. We're gonna re we're gonna re circle back here and talk a little bit more about this adventure. But one of the things we've done to make this an extra adventure, we drove. So we have uh, it's about a twelve hour pull, yeah. approximately from Fairbanks up to the hunting grounds where we were at. And in both instances, both going to and returning, we just kind of did the overnight all night drive. There's not many options. There's really no. It's not like there's a Motel 6 halfway there. There's yeah, nothing there. There's a gas station <laughs> Yep. and a place One. to eat in Coldfoot. Yep. And that that is all. This is a predominant dirt gravel road for most of, of the trek. Uh, not a great one by any means. Certainly not a great one. And some that I don't think any of us have done a lot, maybe dating back to our 20s, which is – getting very little sleep in the course of 24 hours. I mean, we're like flying in. So early flights, Mm -hmm. um, leaving your home, getting eventually to Fairbanks by means of typically Seattle. And then literally like running a few errands and bombing 12 hours. So we showed up to the place we're going to put in around three 30 in the morning. And we just returned yeah. And we got into Fairbanks at like 4.40 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> that was rough. The planning isn't, I mean, you, you got to expect you're going to have an opportunity to get a hotel. But things are different these days. <coughs> and so we showed up to Fairbanks last night. And we must have called 37 hotels at 4 in the morning. And there wasn't a single vacancy at any of them. Not one. But thankfully, Luke and the guys at Weatherby had made a connection last year. Yeah. Which also proved to be very valuable. And by the grace of God, (laughs) Eric answered the text at 4.45 a.m. when we were sending SOS of, hey. The hour of our our most dire need. (laughs) Because we're just absolutely whipped. Nobody's slept. We're just rotating drivers. And we woke up at 6 a.m. and did this big float, which we'll touch on later. But we got into town, and there's no place to sleep. So our options were, A, we, we're in a 12-passenger van, for the record. So option A is drive across the street to the Walmart parking lot and just everybody sleep upright. It's not a great option. Not awesome, based on the level of They uh, do have plug-ins, though. So. They had plug-ins, although we had no electricity. No electricity. But <laughs> that is an option, and it is highly encouraged. And evidently. people definitely do it. There's a lot of campers in Fairbanks. 
Option B is that Eric answers his phone and says, you know what, guys? I'm not in town at the moment, but why don't you go ahead and stay at my place? Let me backlog yeah. Eric a little bit. Can yeah, we talk I about, about him? To, I was about Can to backlog back. Eric yeah, a little ahead. bit. We haven't introduced Eric. Luke, Kevin, Mac did this trip last year. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Did a, a podcast about it. They didn't talk a lot about Eric, but I did a turkey hunt with Luke in North Dakota this year. Mm-hmm. And Luke referred to this guy as Captain America. It's true. That's big. And he praise, told Luke. me it was big. So after the podcast went up, I was like very intrigued. I'm like, I want to do this hunt. I like, yeah. I want to do this with you guys. Like, what's that entail? And they kept talking about this guy named Captain America. Yeah. Quotations with my hands right now. Mm hmm. So it was basically they went and did this hunt, did all those logistics Brian just talked about, got back to Fairbanks. They're going to fly out in a couple of days. They're trying to free some meat. They called. One guy they knew here, was mm-hmm. it, was you tell it, the story. Was it 1-800-Captain-America? Well, yeah, America? so you, 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 have, you have some logistics problems, right? I mean, coming here and then getting home, if you manage to kill, in our case, we filled three tags. So you're like, sweet. And then you have this panic moment like, all right, I got a lot of meat to figure out what to do with. So we knew a guy in town, and he's like, I'm leaving for a sheep hunt literally in 30 minutes. I can't help you. I'm sorry. Let me call a buddy. He calls the buddy, and he's like, he's also about to leave for a sheep hunt, but he knows another guy, and hold on. And so we're like, golly, what now? Well, he puts us in touch with Eric, and Eric's like, I got a hanger. Come on. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Come and get hanger? A hanger. Mean, like, a- like an airplane hanger. Uh-huh. Only in Alaska, folks. Yeah, yeah. So we're like, we're going to show up to this guy, Eric. We don't know who he is, but apparently he's got some freezer space. And he must be awesome because he's just like letting some random people use his freezer space. And uh, much like this year, we had a, a, a massive need. And he just like out of the kindness of his heart is like, yeah, you're welcome to use the freezer space. And then we started talking and then he was like, hey, I'm going to have a cookout tomorrow. You guys want to come? We're like, what can we bring? <laughs> Incredible. So that that um, that leads us to Eric, aka Captain America. Captain America. It's very high praise. I don't I don't know that I'm do all of that, but I appreciate Eric, it. Eric, welcome to the program. Yeah, I would you. I would say you're do all of it based on how you bailed us out last night. That was absolutely clutch. Answer to text at four forty five. It's like, hey, here's where the key is. Yeah. Make it happen. Here's my address. Here's the key. Make yourself at home. Me on hanger as Sue hanger. Yeah, I'm not going to be home <laughs> until 7 p.m. this evening. So take whatever you need and like go to town. And when we say it's an airplane hanger, it's an airplane hanger that has been converted partially yeah. into a residence. Yeah. And it's about the most Alaskan thing you're ever going to find. And not yeah. only is that, there is literally some form of like a Super Cub runway. Not far from your airport. Like it backs up. Tell us, tell us your background, real quick, Eric. So, how I ended up in Alaska, or I've been in Alaska for about five years, and the wilderness has always intrigued me. Growing up in the Lower Forty Eight, and I always had an itch to get here. And luckily, through my employment with the military, they were kind enough to send me up here. And then I said, "Thanks, I'm not leaving." And then around the time that I was due to transition out i found this place for sale um and it has a hangar and i always wanted to fly flying get you places in alaska absolutely and i didn't have the capability to fly but i was able to find a place that can house planes and if you do favors for people with planes maybe they can get you where you want to go and you can work things out so and i think that's like the greatest understatement of alaska yeah if you don't have a plane or a boat even if it's, you're a It's resident, like not having a car. You're just not going to get that far. <laughs> yeah. You're really not. And like yeah. we, we've made several friends from the Alaska range uh, of you know places people are living from Homer to Kodiak to now Fairbanks. And the underlying theme is you just you got to have to have access to a plane or a boat. Yeah. There's just not many roads, period. Now, there's enough guys can hunt off of, for sure, but if you want to try to get away from people, it's mm-hmm. nothing like the lower 48 where you have miles and miles of Forest Service Road or BLM access. It's just very different. And because of that, planes are such a key essential, whether it's a Super Cub or a float plane or whatever. 
Cessna 208 to get you to some remote villages, which you can blast off from a boat. It's a very critical component of Alaska. Yeah. And Eric just so happened to kind of maybe reverse engineer this process of like, I want a plane eventually, but I'm going to buy the hangar first. Yeah. If you build it, they will come. The cart was definitely before the horse on that one, for sure. Plus, I mean, Bachelor, why would you not live in a giant garage where you can have a pool table and a poker table and And snowmobiles and and John boats and four wheelers and and taxidermy muskox and everything I saw last night? You're living the life. And to paint You've the done picture, it well. yeah. for those listening, would be essentially picture a ginormous pole barn shop. Yep. And within that pole barn, you have some built-out spaces of a kitchen, a few bedrooms, some laundry areas. But the overwhelming majority of the square footage is nothing but pure garage goodness. Pure it's true. man room. But you're leaving one like, thing out, leaving one critical thing out, which is a massive vino hood. And what oh, lives yeah. under that vino hood? Nothing but a grill. No a big grill. deal. Just a grill. A yeah. so occasionally. Basically, <laughs> Eric can grill with a barbecue grill in the middle of this room, and there's no fumes that no escape smoke. that. Nope. No. It just gets sucked just, out yeah. through this. It's grill. incredible. This. Yeah. It's the greatest yeah. man room shop home living i've ever witnessed so so we we joked last year that we had we all had like a man crush on captain america because we were jo- we were like heading back down after this like shooting three caribou we had three tags to fill we did it really quick and we're uh our friend uh david was with us and he's he was a single guy and he's like man if if i can just marry a alaskan like girl then i can hunt here all the time like how can i live here and we're like no, Captain America figured it out. That's how you do it. He won. He because it, it he had a, a hangar that he lives in, but it also came with some other houses that were much nicer and bigger that he rents out to pay for the everything else. So I don't remember all the details, but you were basically yeah. living in the hangar, yeah, so pretty I was affordably. Living in the hangar, <laughs> and the, there's a cottage in the main house which has a separate in-law suite. So I had three tenants on that property that was paying the mortgage and utilities. So. After the down payment, I was in the hangar. Not terrible. No. <laughs> We're like, he's got it figured out. And, you know, some of you may be aware of this, but others may not be. As an Alaskan resident, there's there's a lot of opportunities to hunt some pretty incredible species where you do not have a guide requirement. Correct. Now, to clarify, if you are a non-resident and you want to come to Alaska, there are certain species you must have a guide yeah. present, being mountain goat, Sheep, grizzly, and Grizzly's brown bear, browns, yeah. Yeah. slash grizzly. So, <laughs> if you're going to come up here and do those, those are the ones that are going to cost a little bit more money because you got to pay the services of the guide. But it is legally required by the state of Alaska for non-residents to have that. Now, if you have next of kin relations up here, uh, there's some better opportunities for you to come and do those hunts without those stipulations. Does it matter what you identify as? I'm not sure on that one. <laughs> <laughs> It's up for debate, I would imagine, but it's within second-degree kindred, so it depends who you can yep. persuade. And then yeah. if you are a resident, Eric, just painfully, for those of us in the lower 48, what can you hunt almost every year? Um, so we were talking a little bit earlier. I don't have a lot of draw tags this year, so I'm going up on a sheep hunt. Um, it's going up in a sheep hunt that is not yeah. a draw tag. <laughs> no big deal. Let's get that out. Over the counter. Overall sheep hunt. tag. Yeah. Awesome. Um, in Kodiak, you, I mean, you got the deer. I've ta- I've seen goats come down this year already with just over the counter tags. Um, there are opportunities for registration elk tags, occasionally. Um, wow. Black bears. You can get three black bears a year in most places. <laughs> um, brownies and grizz. You can take one, either one per year or depending on the unit, every four years. Um, and there are a few that are draw that are more challenging, like yes, some of the Kodiak, Kodiak ones Kodiak are going to be more difficult. Yeah. Um, what else? Your caribou, obviously. I think in some units you can get up to 10 caribou. And these <laughs> tags are not, they're free, I mean, with your hunting license. Wow. Um, so endless, endless, endless tons of opportunities. hunting moose, opportunities. Obviously, there's a lot of moose. Yeah. So pretty much everything we dream about in the lower 48, if you become Alaskan resident, which takes some time to become a resident, but if you do get that, you really do have 
a tremendous amount of opportunity to fill these crazy cool tags. Yeah. And then once you get here, try not to take it for granted. Yeah. And, you know, then you're still applying for the more difficult Correct. tags. Like yeah. Eric's taking a musk ox, which I think is just a super cool, unique animal that, you know, you don't see a ton of. Super lucky on that. Yeah. And he was telling us about a doll sheep he killed where he literally left on Friday and came home on Sunday and he had killed a sheep. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like, just a doll what? sheep. What? Yeah. People what plan the their whole life. life. So so kill. Sheep hunts go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. But the more time we spend in Alaska, you know, the more intrigue, obviously, it, it drives. And what other species, you know, could it lead to? Uh, the first two that we've kind of tested and played the waters with being the Kodiak experience with Sitka Deer and now Caribou are both exceptionally achievable and attainable for most anybody. The little bit of planning, the logistics. Um, you know, we did the podcast with Garrett and um, talking about kind of similar logistics and planning. There's not a whole lot of different stuff, I would say. It's just preparation. And I, the biggest recommendation I had is if you're going to go with a couple of buddies, divide and conquer. You know, like task out different projects for different people, whether that yep. be transportation, lodging, if you're going to use a transporter service, what have you. Don't all tackle it on your own. And then same thing with like accumulating gear. Like what do you bring? What do you pack? I think there's a lot of stuff you can share as a group mm -hmm. um, on, on this particular trip. You know, Luke brought a pretty sweet teepee shelter. Couple, yeah. Uh, and, and the bigger one kind of essentially was like our gathering and hanging out place when the weather went south, which you're going to expect that to which happen. Which was in most of the time. Yeah, most most of the time, <laughs> right? You're, That's par for the course. Yeah. But, you know, instead of being sheltered up in single or two man tents, for hours upon hours. The teepees were fantastic because we could all hang out together, play cards, eat together, you name it. So there's a lot of stuff you can share, but I would just say if you're planning on trying to do one of these hunts, divide and conquer amongst your group of friends you're going with. Yeah. So not everybody has to do all the work. Yeah, leading up to this hunt, what we do? Probably three different uh, kind of video calls. First was like <coughs> general planning, and then we got into more specifics as we got closer. And then the last one was talking about like, you know, individual meals basically, which Casey crushed. Crushed, absolutely crushed. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's all about communication. Like, okay, you guys had been here before, obviously. Mm -hmm. Okay, what are we looking at for sleeping purposes? What are we looking at for, you know, whatever it might have been? And then it, like, granulated down to, like, what have you guys been eating up there? I'm not a big mountain house guy. And when I say not a big mountain house guy, I'm like, zero mountain house guy. <laughs> <laughs> How is it to get a cooler of food up there? Like, is it possible? Check. And we did it. Possible. It's the, possible. Mm -hmm. The Yeti Panga soft shell cooler uh, was absolutely unequivocally the greatest thing that we took. Here's the biggest difference, though, is, and this is what I was worried about. So last year you guys came to do it, and you guys came prepared to backpack in. Correct. We were going on foot. So you're going in on foot mm -hmm. off the haul road. Yeah. So backpacking in five plus miles off the haul road. We went in crazy minimalist. To hopefully hunt yeah. with a rifle. Yeah. And then float down when you're done. Mm -hmm. So, like, no transportation system, no transporter. <coughs> it was leaving the haul road on foot, getting at least five miles, because that's the law. Yep. And then, if you were successful or not successful, floating down. Well, that changed at the last minute. It did. And you found Hook from Dead Horse Outfitters, which is awesome. You know, like, what, what could he possibly do? Like, could you right. you take, like, a giant stove up? Could you take, like, a giant hardcore uh, Yeti up? Yeah. What I figured out, I went and read everything I could find about Dead Horse Outfitters. Like, everything Hook posted, like, which right. he does a phenomenal job of. So, I figured out that if we could get food fr flown up to Alaska, frozen, we could take it up, eat it, and then float it down. Yep. Or, like, float down without the food because we were going to eat it, obviously. That's what we did, and it was awesome. It was so much better than trying to... to uh, and I'm I'm not zero Mountain House. I don't love them, but I, I can tolerate them. But, oh, my gosh, your stuff was amazing. Pre-cooked meals are the, are the, the ticket on all hunts. 
uh, with the exception of the true backpack style where you just don't have the space in the weight. But Casey had uh, really fantastic food. It was fantastic. It was good. No, Ch the it chili, was real good. It was the good. soup, the what, tacos. What do you call it when you're like in the backcountry? You have food that's oh, like the backcountry uplift. The backcountry mm -hmm. uplift. Yeah. I like that. Big time uplift. Yeah. It was good, for sure. Because let's just we'll, we'll preface it right now, but the hunting wasn't near as great as it was last year. No, it wasn't. It just wasn't. Like no. the hunting was tough, and so we had high expectations just based on the previous year's experience and success that man, we're going to be up there and we're just going to be picking and choosing on what we're going to shoot and there's going to be caribou everywhere. <laughs> and that certainly was not the case. Like, with the exception of the first morning we showed up and we saw one cow caribou from our tent, Yep. we didn't see anything within two miles of our camp. Nothing. 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 Not a cow, not a calf, nothing. Right. Which is unusual because last year you guys were seeing stuff right from your camp. Yeah, and even when we weren't seeing them right from our camp, we were basically seeing them from our camp, but, you know, further down laterally down yep. the same ridge. Sure. And we could see nothing on that first ridge, and we're like, golly, we're just going to have to go over that ridge. And last year we were like, that ridge is far. Why would we go up that? That seems <laughs> like a lot of work. <laughs> and uh, the way I would describe it is the, you can see, if the weather's clear, almost in infinitely like it's yeah it's so flat and barren ground hence yes. the name of the caribou herd or the caribou it's it's species. flat enough you have to get some sort of angle i would say you need a little elevation which, which there's, there's a couple there's sure. not a ton of topography but just enough to where you can get up and see 30 for, feet in elevation does a ton for you exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. And does you, can, you can glass with good optics for 10 yeah. miles probably i would say yeah and so when we were, you know, when we were there, we just weren't seeing anything from glassing point number one, certainly nothing from camp. Glassing point number one turned up maybe one or two caribou. And so we had to continually push further back into the tundra, which if you looked at a picture of it or you saw a video of it, you're going to think that looks absolutely cake. <laughs> <laughs> Walking through a field. Yeah. Like no yeah. big deal. Right. Which to a degree, there is no elevation gain. So that's not difficult. You're not at a high ele elevation in period, you're going to be around 700 feet on average, typically. But aside from that, every single step you take for the entirety of your hunt on the tundra is not stable. Mm -mm. The only, I, I don't know what the best way to describe it is, but every stabilizer muscle within your foot, your ankle, your tibialis, your <laughs> freaking IT bands, your glutes, Everything is being my hips, exercised. My hips hurt. Yeah. Unlike mm -hmm. anything I think you've ever experienced. And we've hunted a bunch of different places where, you know, like in New Mexico, there's a bunch of places where the ground is super challenging and difficult to walk on. But this is just different. There's a, it, it's like there's a give to it to where it feels like you're post holing through snow. And just this instability of every step where you're just constantly having to exercise muscles you probably normally don't. I think the best word to describe it, I think Logan brought it up, is uh, defeating. It's defeating. It's defeating. <laughs> it's very defeating. Um, like, imagine you fill a swimming pool full of half-inflated volleyballs. Yeah. And then throw a tarp over that. For sure. And then you try to walk across that. It's very, very weird. <laughs> And it's funny because we saw a couple guys hiking out the very first day we showed up, and we're like, "My goodness, they are just going so slow! Like, what? <laughs> they must be wiped." And then by about day three, after we just done like a five mile or an eight mile, or we're just we're we're in the same boat that they're in now. We're traveling at a snail's pace, but it's just it, it's different. So Casey's food was in, it's, it was incredible because. We weren't cracking mountain houses. We were coming home to home cooking. Home cooked meals. Yes. Yeah, it was fantastic. And so we bought a little one burner uh, butane stove, which was incredible. It was cheap, but it's certainly effective. We brought in a couple like light backpacking ultralight pots and pans. We had plenty of water in the river that we were camped on to filter. Mm -hmm. So the real beauty ingredient was you know, the home cooked meals. So Casey pre cooked, I think about. Four days worth of meals? Four or five. I thought Breakfast we were going to be able to get rid of, or like be good for a couple more, but we ate 
We crush it. We, we it well. We went we went to town on them. Well, we Which were we were kind of discouraged because the hunting was fairly poor. Yeah. So the meals were fantastic. The sleeping arrangements were solid. So we ran two TP shelters, and we ran one two man tent. Mm-hmm. We set up a lean to tarp to kind of hide gear, other stuff that we had stored um, out of the the elements because. Again, it's Alaska. You're gonna, you're just gonna get wet. Like that. The reality is, particularly on a caribou hunt in the tundra, it's very boggy and marshy. Yeah. Um, we tried to avoid it as best we could, but at a certain point in time in the week, you're gonna just have wet boots every morning. There's no avoiding it. Well, I would bring that up. Like that was kind of a, like a big difference between this year and last year, right? With the your eyes there was wet. less. There was less water, and so it rained more this year. But last year, it felt like there was more water on and in the ground. You had gotten that, like they had gotten more rain before you guys showed up. They must this year. have. Yeah. You know, we came across a couple like uh, what I'll just call creeks on the tundra. You know, they're just kind of like waterways that are running through. I felt like last year there was. 10 times more and you couldn't get around some of them there was a couple where we came across and if you go like you know 30 yards either direction you can probably find a, a spot that's not as deep and you can walk across last year it wasn't that way like if you if you really tried you could maybe find one that was only knee deep instead of waist deep so that was like the big takeaway like talking to you and kevin about this before we went into it this year was like all right like how do we stay dry and you basically were like don't don't even try to stay. Dry. There's no way <laughs> you can't. So I like reach out to a couple of good buddies that have done a couple of hunts up here that have been in Alaska, and they give us some pretty good like tips. Um, it was running plastic boots, not leather boots. Plastic boots, synthetic, synthetic boots, and then you'd run your rain pants the whole time, mm-hmm. and then you actually get uh, gaiters over the top. Of gaiters that. over the top, and then you actually put a strap, a, like a strap, like a velcro strap velcro strap on the bottom of your boot and then up towards your knee and you could cross things like that Hmm. which i will say like it helped brian Uh, ran the whole time up into a point but at a certain point in time when it's when it's raining hard and or you're tired or you're packing meat like you're you're just Some gonna of it, send like, it. Even the best <laughs> rain gear, you're gonna get wet when you're walking through willows that are like thigh deep. Yep. For hundreds and hundreds of yards that are covered in rainwater, and you're just gonna be wet. You know the unfortunate thing about the tundra, there's just there's not a ton of opportunity for building a fire. There's just there's not a lot no of dry wood. wood. There's no trees. Yeah, there's no <laughs> trees. Like there was a little bit of like some dried willows. Driftwood. We we, yeah. we had like a fire one the very last day in the morning trying to like warm up before we did our float but you're not going to have a fire that just isn't happening so you know having good gear is is important leaning into your sleeping bag to try to dry stuff out i think is also important a lot of people don't necessarily realize that you can just hop in there with wet clothes and by the morning you should dry it out if you have a good bag synthetic Yep. and so um we kind of relied a lot on that but it was it was cool too. Like, it, it was a challenging hunt in the sense that we didn't expect it to be that hard. We thought it was going to be much easier. Yeah. And then we I got sure there. Did. And it was so different. I think on the whole, maybe we saw 30 caribou. Would you say mm, 50 tops? I'd say 20. Uh, yeah, probably 20 ish. Yeah, not a lot. And out of that, we saw three bulls that we would have shot. Yes. And we tried for three. We tried for three. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. And so in my in my mind, you know, growing up dreaming of caribou hunting, I, I would have expected, you know, well, almost you, like herds. You of, see pictures of the herds yeah, and there's just, you know, it all, looks like millions. And when you can glass 10 miles, you get up on some <laughs> elevation and you're looking around and you're like, there dude, I can see 180 degrees for 10 miles. I don't see a single caribou. This isn't great. Yeah. Yeah. The problem is not like finding caribou. The problem is like getting a bull you want to shoot clear of other caribou, right? Well, that's what you think the problem is. Well, yeah. Be. Like, yeah. that's what I always thought was like, okay, we're going to see caribou. We're going to see a group here, a group here, like bulls, cows, whatever. We saw 20 caribou in five days. Yeah. And, and let me preface this by saying that 
in those five days, we were spending 11 hours a day glassing. At least. Because yeah. there's a there's a tremendous <laughs> amount of daylight. And if you can <laughs> see in Alaska, you can shoot. I mean, that's the... That's the and what did you say, Luke? Last year, you guys did, what, five miles total? On Probably foot? total, yeah. And we did... Uh, I, I didn't add it all up. I could look it up, but I would say closer to 20 total. Well, we did eight, six, 14, two, and a three. So We just kind of like yeah. progressively pushed further back just, from camp. We did just about 20. Um, which, you know, again, a normal like deer elk hunt is not – that is that's nothing. But on the tundra, it's just more complex. It's more challenging, more difficult. The one day we did like eight something – it was tough, man. That was a tiring, exhausting day. We were out for 12 hours glassing, put in eight hard miles, and when we got back, we were pretty whipped. Yeah. But um, all that said, it's part of, like, the adventure, you know? Like, I think coming up to Alaska on your first time, maybe your second time being early on in it, the lure is the adventure with the hope that maybe you're successful in filling a tag or two. We had you know, delusions of grandeur that we could fill all five tags. <laughs> I think we realized well, there, pretty quickly. There's that, a reason we bought five tags. Yeah. There's, That's right. We, pretty quickly though, we realized like that isn't going to happen. Um, so let's just go do the best we can do and see what we can get out of this situation. But nonetheless, like the overall experience I thought was exceeded my expectations, even though it wasn't as successful as we would have hoped. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, I think it was an adventure, you yeah. know, that's, that's what I always hope for, even on any hunt. Like, I just love adventure. If you get to kill something, that's kind of the icing on the cake. But uh, having, having the ability to go out with good company and, you know, in, endure the suck a little bit together, which we, we did that a lot, both physically and just from the elements. So I think uh, the adventure status was definitely met. And I, I, I certainly had a blast. Well, I definitely think that uh, part of the allure of this trip for me when you guys did it last year was, and I don't even remember who said it, but it was basically we're going on an adventure and we might kill a caribou. Yeah, that's what I told David, the guy that we took. And I started describing what we we're going to do before I even said caribou. And he's like, I'm in. Like, yeah. hold on, let me finish. Yeah, like, <laughs> if you want to go experience Alaska for what it is, that's what we got this year. Yeah. It was, you know, we... It's raw. Did all those things. It was raw. We floated out 23 miles with one caribou. We were hoping it would be five caribou, but at the same time, like, one caribou floating 23 miles on packable rafts uh, was pretty cool. Yeah, that part was awesome. Just, like, the the grind of the drive is creates a different element. You know, when you're you're getting into the place you're going to go blast off and go hunt we, at 3 a.m. We drove through the Brooks Range. Yeah. Like, that's uh, pretty... Like, Brian like said, how, yeah. early on on this podcast, I didn't sleep two nights in the last seven days. I haven't done that since probably high school. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, there, like, yeah. that, that part of it adds, like, a different feel. There's certainly options where you can find a Fairbanks and jump on, like, a little shuttle commuter further north up to Prudhoe yeah. and they'll they'll pick you up or whatever which may, might be in the works in the future but <laughs> as it's you know as it turns out like the first round of just kind of like going all nighter drive style it just added like a different element to it I don't know yeah. it was, there's there's a there's a, a fun element to it it's work but it's all part of the adventure right it was what was the biggest thing Casey you took away from this particular hunt at the end of the day, man, like I told you guys, if you guys watched our uh, Alaska series we did with the fishing, when I took my son up to fish in Alaska, you're going to run out of health. You're going to run out of a lot of things before you run out of time to go do these things. If you ever have any inkling of going and doing something, if it's Alaska, if it's wherever, go and do it. Because life's short, man. Like on those boats yesterday and like looking back and seeing Brian with his caribou seeing my buddies just like floating out on the raft, seeing the Brooks range in the background. Like I had thought about this stuff for, since I was a young kid. I thought about this stuff since like Gordon Eastman was making movies. Mm-hmm. Like I told Spike, or, or I told Hook this going in. I'm like, I feel like I'm on a Gordon Eastman movie. 
he -hmm. was doing this stuff in the 70s and recording it. And when I was a kid, I watched it. I was like, I want to do that. There are certain things in your life that if you like have thought about and you've strived to do, don't make excuses not to do them. Luke, how about you? Take away uh, part do for you. So, yeah, that's a a great question. Um, I really enjoyed having had been here last year and you guys not doing so. Um, I felt... I mean, I'm far, very far from a guide, but I felt somewhat guide-like in that, like, hey, I've done this once before, so I know everything, but um, I just really enjoyed the experience of you guys seeing uh, what I enjoyed so much last year for the first time and almost getting to relive that first time thing through you guys seeing it. And my favorite part of the whole trip last year was the raft out. It just was a blast, and I think at one point you guys were like, "Can can Hook just come pick us up so we don't have to raft down?" And I'm like, "No, the raft out's going to be awesome." And I can't I can't even remember how many times you, Casey, Brian, and Logan all said like, "This is amazing! Like we're getting we're, we're basically getting paid to do this right now." Yeah. And th- that raft out uh, to me like I don't I I love the river I love the water. Um, but but making or whatever you want to call making other people experience that like I love that that was awesome. I will I will say like the raft trip was super cool, uh, new to us for sure, and uh, just super peaceful like a great way to end the trip. Yeah. Regardless, you know we we put in a lot of effort. We were super you know fortunate in the sense that we were able to fill a tag. We had an opportunity on another tag and maybe one more opportunity that we almost capitalized on um, after a bunch of days hunting, but floating down that river. And we, we got just like the most glorious day you could ever ask for in the North Slope. It was a beautiful, sunny day. Yeah. The Brooks Range just got dumped on with snow the it's previous like two days. A fresh 10 inches of snow up there, solid white. It, it was just like a high of 55 <laughs> or something, sunny. Just fantastic. You couldn't ask for a better. Eric's cringing because he's headed up there like in three days yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to go <laughs> he's, cheap. <laughs> exactly. Well, you, with any luck, Eric, like, yeah. the, the weather has passed and you'll be in a better situation. Because yeah. we were thinking as we were floating down, like, I feel for the guys that are up there right now, sheep hunting. Yeah. Getting absolutely pounded. But the trip down the river was really peaceful and kind of surreal and to, to a degree. It was. Um, that was. That was exceptionally fun. And for me... My dad went on a caribou hunt when I was um, a senior in high school. It was 1995, and he went to Quebec, Canada, and did his very first like adventure hunt. He was 40 years old, and he went with his cousin Roger, and they were able to get a couple caribou. He has that caribou today, mounted in his. That was the picture you showed yeah, us. Yeah, I thought that room. was cool. You had that picture, and I have that photo saved of him back back then. So it was kind of full circle for me to be able to go do my own caribou hunt. And uh, I was fortunate enough to to be able to fill the tag, the the one tag that we got this year. And that's another component of it. It's like when you go on these group hunts and you have a number of tag holders, like everybody has (laughs) the hope that... They're going to be the one that gets to kill something. They get to fill the tag. (laughs) I'll just say say it now. Like it's a team tag. It it truly is because... When you're in a situation where there's just so few opportunities presented, um, it's a team effort to who's going to like sacrifice for somebody else to experience success. And you know, Luke and Mac have done it before. They both, I know, wanted to get a caribou. Logan had a tag. Casey had a tag. And um, ultimately, for me to be able to eventually have the success was just super humbling because I know there's a four other guys right on my shoulder that would have loved to have pulled the trigger. And so that just sticks out, man. I think anytime you go on these trips, whether it's with your family or with your friends, um, it really is like a team atmosphere when you're with a group of folks. And Mm -hmm. sometimes you're going to be the guy that pulls the trigger and sometimes you're not. And I know for me, historically over the years, like as I get older, it doesn't matter as much about, 
me filling my own tags is just about being a part of the process and experiencing incredible hunts, whether it's, you know, Casey's daughter, Braley killing a ginormous elk as a teenager or <laughs> being with him and Gage, um, his son, when he killed his first elk, like those stand out in my mind as some of the most priceless hunts I've been on in the last five years. And I don't, I'm not carrying a tag, but I love the process equally so sure um in this instance you know i was lucky enough to to get a great caribou and super fortunate and um really just appreciative to be a invited by luke and then also b to be you know like essentially said hey you're you're up go take a crack at it so those are the the couple things that really stand out to me um from this past trip just aside from the camaraderie and the newness of it, you know, whether some of the, I, I think it, a lot of people have talked about it, but I'm sure Eric can, can attest to this too for as much experience as he's had hunting Alaska the last five years. But the more difficult, whether it's mentally or physically, that hunt is, the more it resonates with you for. Yeah, you know, for reflection. sure. And it doesn't have to be physical or, me- I mean, it's the logistics or yeah. the weather or the conditions, you know, it's, it's the journey i mean it's cliche but it part is, of it yeah. is the journey right for sure and sometimes you know we were talking i was talking to someone else if there's a day that you could harvest an animal on any hunt you always hope it's the last day yeah you know yeah. I don't, but we we've always had a saying that like your last day of hunting is better than your first mm. and for a lot of reasons i think you you develop more knowledge and insight mm. about the species you're chasing in that particular location you know you've got that many more days of the adventure or the experience wrapped up underneath your belt and if you kill out early on the first day there's just not as much of a story there right right? like it kind of like dissipates to a degree alaska for me has always been like that it's intimidating pinnacle right yeah but it's intimidating for sure what would your opinions be eric now living up here of how, coming how many to years you, have you been here? I've been here five years this past summer, or this summer, yeah. What would, so. like, your opinions or your, your thoughts on coming to do an Alaskan hunt? Well, like we were saying earlier, decide what you want to do, I guess, or at least a couple sub, a couple options, and then dive into it with your friends or somebody and figure out step one is just taking that first step, yeah. right? And then going from there. And, yeah, you might need to meet a few people or that first time you go might not be the most successful but every time you're out in alaska you're learning more i mean what i've been here five years and to you guys i have experienced a lot but i look at these old timers that have been here for 40 years and i'm just in awe yeah and i just listen every time for hours and hear things so just taking in everything that people will give you and doing it yeah but yeah i think uh the first step man whether you're going through like a want to transform your life in a physical sense with exercise or a professional sense and within your job, yeah, the most challenging component of that and or planning to hunt is just taking the step and do it. Like yeah. once you start, momentum builds and it gets much easier from that point forward. Mm-hmm. So that first step is so critical and important. But to Casey's point, if you have always wanted to come to Alaska or maybe you've wanted to go to – Colorado and chase mule deer or Wyoming and hunt elk. There's, nothing, there's nothing in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> Stay <laughs> out. There's <Whatever. laughs> nothing in Alaska. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that might be, though, like unequivocally figure Fer- it out. The ferret hunting's pretty good in Wyoming. Yeah. I've heard it's. Yeah. Inc- I've heard there's Phenomenal. some booning crockets. Yeah. Um, make it happen. Make it. Make it happen. We uh, we would encourage you to go watch this most recent Alaska hunt on our YouTube cha- channel if you have not caught it already. Big kudos to Logan and Mac from Weatherby who captured all the beautiful scenery and footage and, and put this stuff together. And then um, as a shameless plug, if you are interested in a firearm, we could not encourage you uh, more to look into Weatherby. Again, it's family owned, 76 years in business. Roy was an incredible um, founder, yeah. and Adam continues to hold the legacy as his grandson today. They've got a great group of folks that work there. They're in the beautiful town of Sheridan, Wyoming, um, 
and they're they really make a, a beautiful firearm so make sure you check out weatherby.com and if you're interested in the hush edition vanguard you can click underneath rifles we will drop you down to the hush vanguard rifle check that out as well and uh we will catch everyone on the next episode of the hush life podcast fall is here man fall is here fall is here fall just is here. a big shout out for uh listening to the podcast yeah thank you like guys. thank you for yeah. the support you can watch it on youtube or wherever you find your podcast we're trying to stay consistent on it as much as we can who knows what will happen in the next three months when we go through hunting season but at the same time thank you guys for supporting this and a uh, big shout out to Weatherby for inviting us on this hunt, and and Captain America for coming through. <laughs> and Captain in the America, oh, man, thanks for thanks for having me. I wish for dinner. If you're not watching, well, it's not like videoed right now, but he looks like Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> I see why they say that. Yeah. Certainly well, came through in a time of need for us with a cape. Uh, big shout dire, out, to Eric. Dire need. You're yeah. always welcome. Yeah, and if you are listening to this and you haven't watched the video, you really need to go watch the video. I think it's going to be a good one. I think, Brian, your uh, your shot was darn near perfect. It feels good. Guy, it feels good when it all comes together. He, he, uh, I would say he didn't take a step, but maybe he took two steps. Yeah. Just kind of as he stumbled I down. Think backwards. Yeah, so I, I would say that's not a step. Yeah, the, was, uh, <laughs> the old 300 Weatherby Man. with 180 it, grand Acubons. It's a... Really did a number on him. Hard, think, hard to beat it. I think it was Shania Twain said one step forward, two steps back. Maybe not. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Could have been. Let's guys. go with Could've that. Been. But anyways, guys, thank you so much for listening <laughs> to uh, this week's podcast of the Hush Life. Uh, catch us next week. Hopefully, we have one for you. That's right. That's right. So long from Fairbanks. Signing out from Fairbanks, Logan. <laughs>